The uh, first thing I'd like to do, just so I can get it on tape, is just to get your name and the correct spelling of it, first and the last name. So if okay. you could give me that. Uh, you want my full name? Sure. Like Robert yeah, S. That'd be. <clears throat> well, my name is uh, Robert S. Rains. And the spelling of the last name? R A I N S. Great. No. So where were you born? Were you from Washington originally, or? But born in Olympia. Ah. And uh, preschool, I moved to Shelton, Washington, and uh, I lived there until I joined the Navy in uh, '41. So how old were you when you moved to Shelton? I was probably uh, four or five just, somewhere in there. Just a little Pre kid. Preschool. Yeah. 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 Your dad was timber, is that right? He worked at the mill there in Shelton, Pope Mill, yeah. Huh. So yeah. how did you decide to go in the service then? Well, my brother enlisted in 1940. And uh, after he left home, I, uh, I kind of thought, gee, that's what I should be doing too, you know. And uh, my grades started falling down because I just wasn't paying too much attention in class and such of that, so. I told mom and dad I wanted to go in the Navy, and they, so they went ahead and signed the papers. And February 41, and I quit school and went in the Navy. Because you were, um, well, 17. 17, right. Yeah, so you still had to get the signature. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, uh, they didn't want to uh, let me go, but uh, I told them I might as well get, get in there and get started because I wanted to make a Navy my career. I knew a couple other people in the Navy, and it sounded like a pretty good deal. That's a big step for a, a high school kid to make. Oh, yes, it was, but uh, I was just treading water where I was. Uh, the thing is, I wasn't learning anything in school. You're just going in one ear and out the other. I was just being there and wasn't paying all that much attention. So I figured I might as well start something here going, and this was something I would probably like, and I did like it. Now, did you, at that time, did you have any vision that you would be headed to war, or were you seeing it oh, more no, as... Oh, no, no. Uh -uh. I just thought of being in the Navy, that's all, uh, being aboard ship. I was raised on the water all my life, and uh, I had uh, plenty of swimming and all this there, so there was no problems there. But I uh, went through boot camp down in San Diego. And then from there, I went aboard the uh, tanker Platte. And uh, we went up to, uh, from San Diego, we went up to Long Beach and uh, picked up uh, some uh, high test gas and uh, fuel oil. And then we went to Bremerton and uh, picked up a load of ammunition, dynamite. This is all on a tanker. <laughs> Things they wouldn't do during wartime, you know, hardly. But uh, then we went out to uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, while I was there, uh, I uh, saw the Pennsylvania and everything, and I took and uh, contacted my brother. He was on the Pennsylvania. And uh, then I checked with personnel and wanted to know if there was any possibility of me transferring over there. So. I guess they worked out a transfer, and I was transferred aboard the Pennsylvania there in Pearl. Well, that was a big difference going from a tanker over to a, to a battleship at uh, Spit and Shine Navy. But uh, I was in the uh, deck force for quite a while, and then I went mess cook, and they put me on mess cooking duty. And I was mess cooking for the uh, signal gang. And uh, I slept in their quarters and everything, and in a hammock, of course. And by the time my uh, mess cooking uh, tour was up three months, I put in a transfer from the deck division into the signal gang, and that was approved. So then I went to the bridge, and that's where I started out being a signal. That was uh, interesting work, and it seemed to come to me pretty easy. And uh, 
Of course, my brother was in the uh, sixth division. He was uh, a, a gunner's mate. He was striking to be a gunner's mate. But uh, we didn't see too much of each other, except maybe on Sunday or something like that, because we were busy learning to get higher up in rank and rate and such as that. But uh, that's what I was going to ask: Is it was a battleship big enough? That the two of you being on there, it was like the two of you living in the same city. I mean, is that? Uh, yeah, across town. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, my workspace was directly up above where his workspace was, so I could I could see down there once in a while. And, uh, of course, we'd see each other maybe in the chow line or something like that. But uh, we, uh, he taught me. Uh, my flags and everything. And then uh, later on, uh, when he was going up to, for a third class gunner's mate, uh, he had to uh, learn more, uh, a little bit more about flags and Morse code, so then I taught him. So it worked out pretty good. But uh, oh, we uh, had the uh, Admiral Kimball staff on. They were Pennsylvania was the flagship of the fleet. And uh, when they came aboard, they came aboard with their whole staff, which was a bunch of more signalmen, more radiomen, uh, boat crews, and things like that, and took everything with him. And uh, when they come aboard, the bridge was pretty crowded. And the only time they come aboard was when we went to sea. And the rest of the time in port, they had their headquarters over to sub base. You're fine. I can. But uh, the uh, we cruise in and out of Pearl on uh, operations, had gunnery exercises and uh, bombardment exercises, air, any aircraft such as that. Uh, lots of drills, man overboard and such as that, getting everybody to know the whole ship and what they were supposed to do in case of emergencies. And uh, made a trip back to the States and uh, Long Beach. I think that's probably around September of 41, somewhere in there. And then uh, about two weeks, then back out to, to Pearl, more exercises. And, and when you're doing the exercises, are you guys taking this pretty serious or is this kind of like, oh yeah, we'll go out and, I mean, do you know a, a war? A training, we, wouldn't think, we didn't think about war. Yeah. Uh, maybe some did, but uh, I was still uh, a kid. Everything was new to me there, and it was exciting. And uh, boy, it was real spit and polish and everything. You had to have clean, real clean clothes every day, whites. But uh, everybody seemed to like it. And uh, of course, uh, like when an airplane would tow a sleeve over for any aircraft practice, they hit that sleeve uh, or with a burst or something and tear it loose. Everybody would let out a cheer, you know, and such as that. And we have a tug come out and would take them tow targets for the main battery practice. And uh, we'd lob shells at it and that was interesting, but that's a terrific noise when those 14 inch guns were going off. But uh, more of a boom, the anti-aircraft made more noise than actually the the 16 inch guns did because they were cr loud crack when they went off, whereas it was a prolonged boom when the main batteries fired. But uh, we did that up until uh, I think it was the first part of December. We went in dry dock. We had uh, alignment on our screws. We had four screws on the pencil, <coughs> and the alignment was a little off, and so they were. We had to go in there and get those repaired. <coughs> the, uh, when the uh, attack came, well, I can reverse that a little bit. On Saturday, Saturday night, we had what they called the Battle of the Bands. And everybody, every battleship had a band. Every cruiser had a band. And they'd go over to the arena and they'd practice and everything. And. Uh, they had this battle of the bands, and uh, it was over pretty late. And uh, <coughs> some of us decided to go on into town. And uh, 
had a few drinks. There was no problem getting anything to drink there. Uh, they would, uh, they knew who was young, too young to drink, but they didn't care. They didn't ask them for identification. They asked the older people. And uh, so we had a few drinks and came back. And I had a uh, cot, folding cot, that I kept up on the bridge. And I slept under cover up there because <coughs> at night uh, it seemed like the smoke out of the stack was seeped, seeped out there and you get black soot. So I was backed underneath the overhang on the bridge there and I up forward and I was uh, sleeping there. And uh, our own fire woke me up, our own firing, on December 7th. And I shook out of it and I couldn't believe what was going on. And I was laying there in my white shorts and a skivvy shirt, no covers or anything, too warm. And I come running out on side and I said, what the heck's going on? And they said, get back in here and get your shoes on. <laughs> Then I came back out, and oh, yeah, it was really the full engagement was going on from the air. I mean, the uh, battleships were being hit on Battleship Row, and uh, there's a uh, airplane comes swooping in right around like it's coming in like a ship, and uh, dropped a torpedo, and it went into the Helena astern of us outside Dry Dock, and uh, it was funny. I was, you could see the guys, so uh, the Japanese pilot, you could see him so plain, you know, he looked like he was smiling at you, you know. As a pitch, one of the pictures I'd always believed of, they were smiling with big teeth. <laughs> That's one of the lines that stuck in my mind. But anyhow, half of us were split off and put in the conning tower, which is 16-inch uh, thick steel to keep, in case there was a bomb hit the bridge or anything, well, there'd be half of the crew of the bridge would survive, and they could do that. But anyhow, some of us were ushered in there, and uh, I was in there, I guess, about a half hour, and I come back out, and by gosh, here goes a Nevada steaming by. Nevada was the only battleship getting away, and she was steaming by, everybody was there yelling and everything, and about that time, the, uh, I think it was the, Destroyer Shaw got hit, and it just, it was sitting in dry dock up high, and it got hit, and it just blew sky high, blew the bow right off of it, but, uh, and then the Nevada was pushed over to the side, when she was going, they didn't want her to block the channel in case she got sunk, they wanted to push her off the side, so they went ahead and did that, but the, um, a lot of fire was coming down battleship row from the oil out of the Oklahoma and the Arizona. It's coming right up towards California. I think the California even got uh, her side scorched on that, some of that. But uh, we had a, uh, a break and the second wave came in. Then that's when uh, Pennsylvania got hit. She got one bomb. Had uh, 23 casualties on there. But uh, luckily it uh, that hit between me and my brother. He was, uh, after the, uh, the second wave, they gave a stand easy. And uh, I got permission to go down, leave my battle station and go down to check on my brother. <laughs> he was first loader on a three inch gun. And he was standing there with a the projectile in his hand and I, he couldn't hear me. I asked him how he was doing. He couldn't hear me so I tapped him and he almost dropped that shell. <laughs> But uh, later on, we got together and talked about it and everything, but it was just something else. They uh, had a mine layer that was uh, moored outboard of the uh, Helena, which was a stern of us. And the torpedo went underneath the Oglala. She was a wooden hull ship. And went into the Helena and it exploded, and that cracked the hull of the uh, Oglala. And she started taking on water, so they got the tug and pushing her back astern, but it capsized before they could get it up against the dock. Uh, the Helena had minor damage, from what I understood. But uh, that uh, about noontime, we uh, we got a break, and uh, they let part of the 
crew go down below and get something to eat. I had some crackers and soup. And uh, we were right in the middle of eating in our compartment. All of a sudden, there was a loud bang up above. Well, of course, the table went up flying, and everybody tore out of there. We thought we were starting all over again. And uh, turned out that the yard workmen were lifting this motor. We had a 50-foot motor launch up on top of the boat deck. And they were lifting that off to take it off the ship so they could clean up where the bomb went through. And they dropped the damn thing right above where we were eating. <laughs> but uh, we didn't have any more after that until uh, oh, it must have been about 10 o'clock that night, somewhere in there. And everybody started firing again. And it turned out that uh, some of the Enterprises, I think it was the Enterprises, planes were coming in that was going to land at Ford Island. And they came in a restricted area. And uh, I think there was five of them. And uh, I think three of them got shot down. They were in the wrong area. And of course, nobody knew what they were. But uh, that was, from then on, there was no more, no more firing in the harbor. It was all over then. But it was uh, something else. We uh, stayed in there, I think it was until the 19th of December, getting repaired. Oh, I should say about the two. We had two destroyers ahead of us in dry dock. And they both got hit and caught fire. And they flooded the dry dock to help put out the fire. And of course, we played water off, off the forecastle down onto the two destroyers up there to help contain that fire. They had, a, they had their depth charge racks right underneath our valley, you might say. And they kept them wet down until they got rid of the fire. But like, uh, we left, uh, I think, on the 19th of December. And uh, had the, uh, I think it was the Tennessee and the Maryland with us. And we headed for Bremerton for repairs. And uh, we got uh, 250 miles from the entrance out here. And uh, we got a message to go to San Francisco. <coughs> so we turned around and went to San Francisco. Here this was right close to home. And uh, we went down to San Francisco. And we were in there getting completely stripped of our anti-aircraft batteries. And of course, the, on the old battleships, they had 5-inch broadsides, 5-inch 51 broadsides to shoot out the sides. And they had casemates in there. They had to <coughs> take and cut all that out. And then they remodeled it and put new guns on, 5-inch 38s, which are dual-purpose guns. And uh, when we came out of the yard there, we had uh, 10 5-inch 38s, 5 on each side. We had uh, 40, 40 millimeters put on, quad 40s. And I think there were 60, 20 millimeters did away with the old machine guns and such as that. And they cut off our masts uh, back aft and got rid of that. And uh, we stayed in there till, uh, well, I left it in 43. And we only got underway twice during that time. Once was during the Battle of Coral Sea. We went south of Hawaii. And then the Midway battle, we went north of Hawaii. And in case something went wrong and we got pushed back, there'd be another, def another defense there. But there was no action, and uh, we came back. And then I, I got transferred to put the New Jersey, battleship New Jersey, in commission. And while I was at the receiving station there in uh, Long Beach, they came in an emergency transfer, and they took me and jerked me off that draft and put me on a yard oiler. This is a concrete barge. It had no power of its own except for a steering motor. And uh, we were, the next day after I got aboard, we were, went towed out there and put up behind a merchant tanker. 
and towed all the way to New Mill, New Caledonia. It took 31 days. But uh, we uh, got to Nume and uh, I had the uh, seagoing tug, the Pawnee, picked us up and took us uh, and towed us up to Tulagi Harbor in the Solomons. And we anchored uh, bow and stern in there. And uh, destroyers would come in on both sides of us. and. Uh, get their fuel and ammunition, and uh, then they'd take off. And they'd, they'd expend all that during the night and be back the next morning for more <laughs> of that much. But uh, this went on for quite a while, and then I was talking to a signalman at the, on the, uh, at the base over in Tulagi, and uh, he wanted to know if I wanted to transfer, and I said, sure. <laughs> I'd get off of here. So I, he, he worked a swap from that end, and I went to the tower. And I stayed on that tower until, uh, oh gosh, uh, 40, uh, must have been about May of 44. And then uh, I was transferred to the uh, Cub 12, which was a com combat utility battalion. And we trained with the Marines to set up a beachhead. And uh, trade there for until uh, September. I was getting ready to, for an invasion of Peleliu. And I got your orders to come back to the States. I'd been out there for 18 months. And uh, so they took me and put me in the receiving station. And uh, I stayed there a month. And uh, I was kind of glad of it because, boy, this, uh, that Peleliu was a mess up there. And uh, there was a lot of people got lost in that that I knew. But uh, I went back to, <coughs> excuse me, I went back to the States, got there in uh, probably November of uh, 44. I got 30 days leave. And uh, in January, I reported to uh, receiving station down in San Francisco. And uh, all of a sudden, I got orders to uh, go to the British Pacific Fleet. And uh, I couldn't believe what the heck I was reading and uh, joined a liaison team. And I had a A1 priority. And uh, I said, on my orders, it said, any delay on this man's transportation will hazard the war effort. <laughs> I was bumping everybody, captains, <laughs> commanders, all the way down to Sydney, Australia. And uh, gee, we got out there at uh, this uh, Manus Island, and this commander was uh, going down to Sydney for R&R, &R, <laughs> bumped him off, and he said, that can't be. <laughs> But uh, we went from there, uh, from uh, Manus Island down to uh, uh, Townsville, Australia, and then down to uh, Brisbane, and then down to Sydney. And uh, I reported aboard a uh, British destroyer, the uh, HMS Termagant, as a communications liaison with the British Navy and the American Navy. And uh, they had just came over from Europe being as the war is over over there. And uh, so we had a radioman first, myself, a signalman first, and uh, a JG as a liaison officer. And uh, so I hung out on the bridge, and uh, the radioman, radioman, of course, he was down below, but we all slept in different places. I was in the after mess, the radioman in the forward mess, mess, I mean. <clears throat> but uh, we uh, stayed in Sydney for five days, then we got underway, and we had the uh, King George V battleship, and the illustrious, and the implacable two carriers, and uh, we went up by uh, Formosa, and uh, in the Okinawa area, and we were up there. They sent in airstrikes and such that we never did see anything. It's always saw the planes landing and taking off with the carriers. 
But then uh, we took and uh, retired, and we came back down to uh, Manus Island for uh, a few days to replenish uh, fuel and ammunition. And then we went back up again and made a couple strikes. And uh, that was over a period of about, uh, about four months. And uh, while we were in uh, Manus there, I wasn't getting any coffee, less tea. And like tea and tomatoes for breakfast, you know. And uh, I had this letter to any supply depot that I was to be able to requisition anything that would bring my living up to what it was in the Navy, in our Navy. And so I went over there at Manus, and I went in there looking around, and I found this coffee, Silex. And uh, there's a hot plate. And so I told this uh, chief, that I says, uh, I'd like to requisition that. And uh, he says, no, no, he says, uh, I can't do it. That uh, I showed him a letter. And he says, we still can't do it. So I asked to see the supply officer. And uh, he took a look at that letter, and he came back with me. And he says, chief, he says, give this guy anything he wants. I gave him that coffee maker, the hot plate. He says, give him 40 pounds of coffee. I had two 20-pound tins of coffee. And I went back aboard ship, and uh, I was hooking it up, and uh, I was, uh, started making a pot of coffee. And of course, on that silex, the coffee grounds were up in top, this bowl. And down below, you had the water. And when the water got hot, it went up in top with the, with the coffee grounds. And then when it all got up, you turned off the, hot, the heat. And uh, the coffee was just sitting there. And, uh, and this here one uh, deckhand, he says, OK, Yank, he says, uh, you got that up there. Now how are you going to get it down? So I took it off, and I set it on the deck there. And as soon as it got a little cooler, it came down. And I'll tell you, that was the talk of the ship. Everybody wanted to come back and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> but uh, that helped out a lot, uh, had to have a cup of coffee, because I was Uptight, you know. We always had bridge coffee on the bridge. Always had coffee on the bridge, on our navy. But uh, we, uh, let's see. We were preparing to go up and make another strike, and uh, we got the word that the war was over, and so I was transferred ashore to another ship on a transport with some other people, and we're headed back to Pearl. And uh, got back in Pearl, and there was an all-nav, <coughs> excuse me, there was an all-nav 209 came out. It said anybody that had re-enlisted during the war could be sent back for 30 days leave. Well, I'd re-enlisted uh, when I was, see, I was on a kid's cruise, and uh, so I'd re-enlisted for four years. And so I got to go back home on leave again. <laughs> but uh, just before, I forgot to say, just before I went to, uh, to the British fleet, I got married. Married my gal from my hometown. But uh, so we went back up home on leave together. She was staying in San Francisco with her sister. But I uh, stayed there. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, I took a ship. I took a transport that was going to be decommissioned in Norfolk and run around through the Panama Canal to Norfolk and then all the way back across, to, across country again after I got rid of that thing. And then I got orders to uh, report to the receiving station down at uh, Long Beach. And we no sooner got down there, and I got a set of orders to go to China. And gee, we only been married about six, seven months. But anyhow, uh, I went to China. I got out there, uh, and uh, on the way, I got word uh, 
that uh, I had a son was born. And uh, the, uh, my brother-in-law was on a destroyer in San Diego. And uh, when he got the word that I had a, uh, had a child, well, he went up to the radio shack and sent me a message onto that transport. That's the only way I knew it. But, but uh, I stayed out there for six months, went to Shanghai first, and then up to Tsing Tao, China. It's the northern part. I don't even think it's called Tsing Tao anymore. But uh, I stayed up there. I was on a signal tower there. And uh, we communicated with the fleet way outside in the harbor. But uh, the communists were getting pretty close after I'd been there a while. We, at night, we could just watch the red flash in the sky over in the hills and everything. They're getting closer all the time. And we had a big detachment of Marines there, but uh, they were protecting uh, the embassy and such as that. But uh, they finally, they started evacuating and uh, evacuated from there. And back to the States, I came again. I'll be darned they didn't give me 30 days leave again. But. Uh, then I got uh, orders to uh, new construction and I went to a destroyer, the uh, Lloyd Thomas in uh, Bethlehem Steel in San Francisco. We lived in naval housing there while the ship was getting fitted out and everything and we're going on shakedown and such as that. And then we went to uh, San Diego for shakedown and uh, being home ported there. So my wife, uh, I got her settled in a Quonset hut out in National City and fight the cockroaches. <laughs> and we stayed there until uh, we got orders to uh, depart for, with the uh, escort to Valley Forge, aircraft carrier. It was going on a world cruise. And I'd had in for shore duty up in Seattle for quite a while. And uh, I was hoping maybe I, it would come through and I could get it. And, uh, but uh, finally it came through and it didn't go to Seattle though. I went to San Diego for 11th Naval District and they sent me out to the Naval Training Center to push boots. Well, I had to, I pushed uh, one company through, and I thought this is not for me. And uh, the wife says, "Are well, you sure?" And I says, "Look at." I says, "I gotta put them guys to bed at night." I says, and I finally get home about ten, ten thirty, and I says, "I gotta be out there to get them out of bed in the morning." I says, "That's not for me." And uh, she says, "Well, do what you want." So I put in a request to be transferred, and I. Uh, this commander called me down to district headquarters and he says, what are you doing? I says, well, I says, if I have to, I'll go back to sea. And he says, well, you go on back to the training center. We'll take you out of the recruit training command. And uh, you can stay there and do whatever the base has for you to do until you get some orders. So I was only over there about a week and they gave me orders to the Naval Reserve Training Center in Compton, California. And uh, so I went up there, and I was up there until uh, June of uh, 1950. All of a sudden, I just got back. I didn't have a car, neither did the wife. We didn't have hardly a pot to pee in. And uh, I was hitchhiking back and forth from Compton. I just got home and was laid down on the Davenport and I got a phone call and it's 11th Naval District Headquarters. Uh, they said, we got a new set of orders for you. Uh, uh, come down and I says, well, gee, I, all my gear's up in Compton and everything. And they says, well, you come down here and check in and uh, then we'll let you go back and get your gear. And I said, okay. So I went ahead and I got a bus, got on a bus and went down there. And gee, they gave me uh, my orders and uh, put me in a jeep and took me over to North Island. 
And uh, I said, what's going on? And they said, well, you're flying out of here at 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Just like that. And I had no idea where I was going or anything. I didn't even have my orders in my hand yet. And uh, so I called the wife and told her the situation. And uh, so she called her sister and her husband out that lived out in La Mesa. So they, uh, so my wife went ahead and washed out the clothes I had that I brought home from Compton. And uh, she had them ready. And my brother-in-law, he took and uh, stopped and picked the wife up and brought her over there and brought me my clothes. And I was gone. <laughs> But I ended up going all the way to, uh, on a ship to, uh, oh, I flew as far as uh, on one of those there uh, PBM Mariners, that Jato assist take off the water, and uh, went to uh, Pearl, and then they found out one of those planes had had trouble out at Midway, so they grounded them, and they put me aboard a, a destroyer tender and made the rest of the trip and went to uh, to uh, Tokyo and uh, put aboard the uh, Mount McKinley, which was a uh, communication ship, which uh, Admiral Doyle was embarked on. He was uh, commander of the amphibious forces. And uh, we sat there and uh, in Tokyo for a couple months while they were planning the invasion of Incheon. This is the Korean War started. And uh, then we went up and uh, we started to make a landing at uh, Wonsan, but there was two, two mined in there, so we pulled out and went around and made the landing in Incheon. And uh, we were there for quite a few days. And then they tried to make another landing at uh, Wonsan, and uh, the place was mined, and they had mine sweepers in there. Two of them had already been sunk by mines, and uh, they decided not to have a have a landing. And we started to pull up our anchor, and the darn mine was <laughs> was hooked in the anchor. So they had uh, the underwater demolition guys, UDT, come over and take care of the mine, and then we pulled up and went out of there. And we went back to Japan. No, we went down to Pusan. And uh, we stayed in there for almost a month. And uh, then back to Japan. And then in uh, December, we went up to Hungnam, up in North Korea, to evacuate because we were getting pushed back by the Chinese and the North Koreans. And uh, we took and uh, were the, the only three ships behind us that, uh, and when we left. And that was underwater demolition and a heavy cruiser in there bombarding the beach. But uh, then back down to uh, Korea, and we spent Korea, spent the Christmas in uh, Korea in port. And some of those Marines we had, <laughs> they'd been up there in the snow and everything else. They were so glad to have a Christmas dinner, something else. But then back to Japan again. And, oh gosh. The Mount McKinley went back to the States and they transferred me over to uh, the uh, communication ship El Dorado, which had uh, Comfib pack aboard, Commander Amphibious Forces. They just came out to relieve Comfib Group 1. So I was sent with them. And uh, after I'd been out there 14 months, uh, FedPAC went back to the States. And on the way, I got transferred from TAD to FedPAC to permanent duty with FedPAC. So then I was stationed in Coronado for quite some time. And uh, that made it a little easier on the family. But. Uh, I stayed there uh, on uh, when FIDPAC got to uh, back to Coronado. Uh, uh, we were assigned on the signal tower there at, uh, at Coronado, and uh, we took and uh, stayed there until uh, fifty-seven, and uh, 
I got orders to go aboard the amphibious uh, ship Lenaway transport. And I stayed on her for, oh gosh, uh, till 1959, when finally I got orders for shore duty up in uh, uh, Seattle. And I uh, finished my Navy career up there in Seattle, stationed at Pier 91. <coughs> and then uh, I went ahead and retired in January 61. And that was about the end of it. Wow. So I I'm going to go back to you got married after Pearl Harbor when you came back? No, no, to in 1945. 1945, before the war was over. Oh, okay. You, you, you'd you come, come back to stateside, got married, and I, then... I came back in the South Pacific, and uh, this was in the, the end of 44. And then in 45, uh, the wife and I got married. We went to school together, and uh, she was working down in San Francisco with her sister. She was working for the Bank of America for a while, and then she was working for... Uh, the offices of um, Metro Golden Mayor for film distrib distribution. And uh, when I came back from the Solomon Islands, I just called her sister to happen to see, uh, see if she, her, uh, she was around, and bigger than heck she was. <laughs> but we got back together. Long story. Had you been corresponding all, all the time? A couple of times, a couple of times. Huh. When I first uh, was over there, but uh, after uh, the war started, I, I don't think I had more than one letter, I think. Just uh, speculation. <laughs> <laughs> when you were in dry dock, it's again hard to give people the perspective of because Hollywood has changed Pearl Harbor from what it really was. Oh, yeah, right. From where you were, how far out are some of these ships that you're talking about, the Arizona, and how close are you to them? Uh, oh, I'd say uh, probably 500 yards. It's, it's, it's close. Uh, it's, it's close enough that uh, you could take and send messages back and forth by semaphore, and you can see the person. Uh, it's real close. Uh, when there's, there's explosions all, all over there, like on the Arizona, uh, you could feel them. I mean, it was something else. But uh, we were, uh, like when we were in dry dock, our bridge was just above the le level of the dry dock. Everything else was down in. And uh, so we, could, we had a pretty good, up on the bridge, we had a uh, pretty good look at everything that was going on. The, uh, you know, the practically, uh, there's a few cruisers got out and uh, quite a few destroyers. And they, they were steaming flank speed all the time they were out looking for the Japanese. They, uh, these tin cans were coming back in that night and it looked like their stacks were just white the paint, they got so hot that they were blistering the paint off. But, uh, of course, uh, they never really did expect anybody to come from the north. Uh, there's a couple stories that I have heard, whether they're factual or not, I'm not sure. <coughs> they had uh, four PBYs. They had different sectors to search. And uh, on that day, there was no patrol to the north, where the other sectors were all covered. Now, nobody has ever explained that to me. Now, whether it's true or not, I don't know. And it's supposed to have been told by one of the, uh, a book written by one of the uh, pilots on the PBYs. But uh, nobody expected anything from the north. And of course, uh, to tell you the truth, we didn't expect anything that morning. I mean, uh, Everybody was getting ready to think about going ashore, going to church services, or something like that. Those are the biggest uh, debates, you know, all the theories on who knew well, what. Who do you who do you believe? You know, this is the thing. Who who do you believe? 
I, uh, there's, uh, everybody that wrote a book has a different perspective of it. Uh, maybe they come close to dry, uh, drawing the same conclusions and everything, but they have pretty wide views of it to start with. Did, because you, you talked about being able to, I mean, you saw the pilots, they were close enough as, as they This could. one, yes, this one. So was it real or was it like watching a movie? Does fear take over or what? There was no fear. There was no fear at all. It was exciting. Uh, afterwards, you got to thinking about it. My good God, you know. And, uh, of course, now, these people that uh, had to abandon their ships and everything like that. Now, I can see where there's probably some fear there or getting blown up on their ship. I can see where there's some fear there. But to me, uh, I just didn't, it just didn't strike me that way. No, we got uh, bombed a few times down there in Tulagi when they'd have an air raid. And uh, we, they had caves down there where the Japanese had caves. And uh, we'd bail out from our sleeping quarters at night and dive in one of them caves. Well, now, I had a little fear there on something like that because you didn't know what the heck was going to come. But that was uh, something else. At, at Pearl, did you have a pretty good idea? I mean, because it's all happening and things are being bombed, but you could tell what was going to be bombed as it happened? I mean, was it? No. Uh -uh. And so just Most of it, I, uh, what I saw, was I saw later after it happened. It, because uh, you were watching something else, no, you were looking up like this, or or undercover. I was undercover for a while there. And your ship took one 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 bomb. They just uh, had uh, two near misses, and uh, one got the destroyers up in front of us, and the dry dock there, the cast <coughs> the cast into the downs. But the. Uh, when the uh, Shaw blew up, there was a, it was, oh, probably maybe 200, 200 yards from us, and uh, it uh, was a heck of a concussion. I, I felt that more than I did anything else, I think. I didn't even know we'd been hit until after it was over with. But uh, most of our casualties were. Uh, in the marine area because they were manning that part of the ship. They had the anti-aircraft battery there, they had a broadside battery and their sleeping quarters it was all in the area where this bomb came down and it went down to the third deck and exploded down there. But uh, I don't know how many deaths there were but uh, originally there were 23 casualties and uh, I imagine a lot, a lot of those that lived. Was it just loud all the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, while this was... We, had, uh, we finally got some cotton stuff on our ears. We usually kept some on the bridge anyhow for when we went out training to stuff cotton in our ears when they were firing. But uh, this here came quick like, uh, you know, and uh, those there muzzles of the five-inch battery which, and the aircraft batteries were shooting straight up. Well, their muzzles was right to the level of our bridge. Of course, we had fancy canvas work and Turks' heads and everything else around the railings and all that. Just blew them off. <laughs> wow, the the because um, the noise aspect is is amazing. The other thing is is that movies portray Pearl Harbor as being very quick. I mean, it that's was it was. The, we only had uh, we had two attacks, and uh, I couldn't tell how long they each lasted, but uh, it was quick. It was like. I like to say about probably 10, 1030 was all over with. And there was time in between. But uh, no, it was quick. Uh, they depict a lot of uh, airplanes flying in and out of buildings and all that uh, in the movie, of course. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, they did come down and strafe. They strafed our bridge and such as that. But uh, we didn't have any casualties from the strafing. How long did it take for your nerves to settle down? Well, probably that night until they got erupted again when we was firing at our own planes coming in uh, that night. 
But the next day, is, it was trying to get everything back together with and everything so we'd get out of dry dock. And they doubled up the work. We got a, uh, my barber here, in, uh, he lives here in Port Angeles. And uh, his dad was a crane operator there. And uh, he was uh, eight years old at the time, I think, the boy was. And uh, he remembers a little bit, but not much. But uh, his dad got a lot of extra work at coming in there cleaning up stuff with this big hammerhead crane, lifting stuff on and off the ships. And that's part of the amazing part is yeah. the fact of the devastation that happened, but yet how quickly, relatively speaking, the, the, the servicemen put these ships back together. Oh, yeah, right. You know, got you back to Bremerton and San Francisco so you could do more work on them. But. Yeah, see, we didn't have any uh, damage to our uh, armor around the ship or anything like that, so we were, could float immediately. And uh, two of the, uh, the Maryland, I think, and the, and the Tennessee, they were moored inboard on Battleship Row. So uh, they didn't have any hull damage either. And so as soon as uh, they could get clear of the ships, they could pull them out. You see, you had the, these uh, concrete pilings, you might say, that they moored against. And uh, then the other ship moored to them. So they had to cast off that ship like they had to cut the lines of the uh, Oklahoma when she went over. And uh, uh, the West Virginia, uh, she was uh, sitting on the bottom, and so they had to take and pull the, them out from the inside. But their holes were in good shape, no problems there, so all three of us were flo uh, been able to float and everything and steam back. Do, do you remember when you first came to Pearl Harbor? Because I've, I've heard a couple people describe, one guy had been on some little tin can, and he, said, he, he described coming into Pearl Harbor the first time. This is before the attack. And just and he was a sailor and wanted to be a sailor. And he says, "Looking at those ships, <laughs> what, was that your? Do you remember coming in the?" Yeah, I, uh, I couldn't. Uh, I thought, man, this is the Navy, you know. Uh, it was really something. But uh, and of course uh, there were. I think four of the battleships were out. When I, uh, I came in. And uh, we tied up right in Battleship Row. We had a place there where you discharge your, your aviation gasoline and everything there for the air station. And uh, we tied up right there. And of course, then in come all these battleships from out, you know, come steaming in. I could watch them come in the harbor and then they went around the island and then came up and moored right on down the line, you know. It's fantastic. And of course, there are escorts and everything coming in. It's, it is something. No, we used to go out on, uh, on uh, battle practice. And uh, there were uh, uh, eight, nine of us. And uh, all in a row. One, right in one column with the escorts around. And of course, this was uh, when we were maneuvering, well, this was part of my job. I'd run up flags to say to make a turn to the right or a, a whatever, make a 90 degree turn to the right or just to make it a, 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 a turn instead of a course change, all this here. And uh, sometimes we'd put it, make, it, make it a turn and everybody would be in line and all of a sudden they'd go like this and they'd all be going in the same direction but they'd be staggered off down the line. You know. But we'd do this all the time out there and uh, that was part of my job, was running up the, these flags down and everything and such as that. And at night we'd do the same thing only we'd use a, a blinker and uh, execute at the same, everybody at the same time. But uh, it, was, it was just something else, it was just, that was peacetime Navy. It's amazing because the size of the vessels, I mean, these are 
floating cities on the water and, and we were see we were 608 feet long and uh, 106 foot beam well that's a small ship nowadays they've got the destroyers that are darn near that big but uh and we had uh Eighteen hundred men, I think it was assigned to the ship. Well, then when the flag came aboard, they took uh, and uh, made us about twenty-two hundred or something like that. And it's like a small city. It's just like uh, well, like to give you an example. Uh, I think it was a uh, Lexington. Mm. It's either the Lexington or the Enterprise was in port and uh, here in Seattle. And uh, Tacoma City had a, a malfunction in their power. And they took and put, took that carrier, put that over there and hooked up and it supplied the city of Tacoma with all their power. This was before the war. Well, you know, it's, it's, it is a city within itself. When, when was, do you remember the first time going back to Pearl Harbor uh, after leaving from the attack and then going back and seeing it again later? Uh, let's see. Well, I came back there at uh, when the war was over. And I was only there for two days. I didn't go ashore. I just went ashore for transportation back to the States. That's all. And uh, it was all cleaned up in there. I mean, uh, the uh, they still had parts. I think had parts of the Arizona was still standing up yet. Wow. Then they hadn't uh, really decided what all they were going to do with her. But uh, then I was back there several times when I was going back and forth on ships to the far east. It always made a stop there at Pearl, and. Uh, I never, never went ashore. My wife says, I always wanted to go out there. I says, there's nothing there. <laughs> I don't you, know, maybe someday I'll get her out there. Have you ever, oh, you've never gone back to the memorial then? No, I never have. I've uh, been, the last time I was there was uh, 59. When I was coming back to the States, so we stopped in there and everything. And this was before the, this was before the memorial was built. Then you could still see the see the Arizona as you went by it. Uh, you could uh, see where the turret they took her turrets off and such as that. You, you, your brother survived the service also. Yep. Yeah, he uh, he ended up up in Alaska. He uh, went up there. He didn't retire from the navy. He went out and uh, he was working uh, with a uh, carpet furniture company, laying carpets and such as that. And then he went to Alaska and he lived up there. He uh, married a gal from New York and they had four daughters. He died about, uh, oh heck, 15, 20 years ago. Got drinking too much. Diabetes. But uh, got through the war okay though. It's a shame to waste your life like that after you make it through something like that. Do you think, having seen Pearl Harbor firsthand and the travesty of war, is there something that the history books have left out that we need future generations to know about either Pearl Harbor specifically or World War II? Only that... Uh, you just never know when the disaster is going to strike. And uh, the only thing you can do is, is be prepared for it, no matter what. It's, it's like it's unexpected, just like that was. Or just like uh, the Twin Towers, when they hit that. I mean, it's completely unexpected. But the thing is, we should be able to have people in place in order to intelligence, get, in, get good intelligence to prevent things like this from happening. 
But uh, I think that uh, it's just a rude day of awakening after something like that happens and people after that, then they get real patriotic. Uh, right now, I don't know. Uh, they got a big problem going on in this world today. <laughs> And you, know, you're, uh, you don't know where it's going to come from. It, it can come from any place. I was just hearing on the news there today where they know that North Korea has a uh, ballistic missile that can hit the West Coast. Well, I tell you, I wouldn't put anything past them over there. And uh, the thing is, uh, you got two communist uh, nations there uh, in uh, China and North Korea, and just like it happened in North Korea, the Chinese will come right in there. They didn't want the Americans over there getting a good foothold up in there. So they come in there and push them out. So we're going to have a problem here now. If he messes around and goes into Iraq without uh, the backing of these other nations, uh, like they say, uh, Houston, we got a problem here, <laughs> and it's a big one. Tough situation. Knowing what, the, like you said, you don't know where it will come from. Or... Do you think that um, people have told me, it was interesting because I've been working on this project since about 1995, and I'd heard a lot of Pearl Harbor stories, but then the day I was driving to Tacoma on 9-11, we are going up to McNeil Island, and three of us sat in the car and just silent, amazed, couldn't believe then watch the TV and people have said that's going to be the Pearl Harbor of my generation. Do, do you think that's an accurate comparison between the Twin Towers and Pearl Harbor? Well, it's, it was practically an equal disaster uh, as far as uh, lives were concerned because the, it's pretty much the same uh, amount of lives were lost in both instances. Uh, as far as damage goes, we suffered much more damage then than they did on the Twin Towers. But uh, I, uh, I, don't know, I, I just couldn't compare them. To think that the, those people were trained right here in the United States to be able to do that, to accomplish their mission. They were trained right here. They were taught to fly and everything else right here. And to, to think that uh, we let something like that happen, uh, I know that the uh, powers to be knew that these people were getting lessons here and everything else. But then, that, uh, to my way of thinking, they should have kept better track of them. You know, uh, when I was on uh, shore duty up in, uh, in Seattle, we were giving all these ships away. And uh, the Iraqi and the Iranian crews, these ships were, be given, uh, were given to, were coming right over there to Pier 91 and training on these ships and everything. Uh, let's see. There was another country over there too. Oh, I think Greece and Turkey, were, uh, we were giving ships to them and everything else. We were training them. And a lot of them were terrorists, actually. Not all of them, but probably quite a few of them. They don't have the same thought about life as we do. They don't care about life as much as we do. And uh, the Japanese were the same way. Uh, they say they're not anymore. Uh, whether they are or not, I don't know. But they would give up their life uh, for crashing into another ship or something like that. And that's what these people, the same thing, suicidal, just to accomplish something. And they have this uh, brow beaten into them from a early age. The Japanese, uh, from what I understand, uh, we started the war with Japan. That's their opinion over there. That's what they teach in their schools and such as that. But uh, 
do you go to war to get more oil? That's what it boiled down to there, isn't it? Is this, here we are, we're right back here again. It's, uh, Saddam says it's the oil. Venezuela, they say we need their oil, and uh, we, we get it, we guzzle it down. So I don't know where it's going to all end. It gives you a lot of food for thought. Thank you very much. Are you still recording?